slide is our question and answer night. And um, I guess Dennis is trying to draw attention to that fact by selecting as the invitation song, what will your answer be? And selecting as the song beforehand, this solemn question and answer, is worldly gain thy goal? Uh, well, and while those are good questions for Christians to contemplate or for anybody to contemplate, uh, that wasn't the submitted question that was in the box, uh, but nonetheless, um, I, I appreciate the uh, attention to detail. Um, the question that I got to this time, I'm not tackling them all in the order I get them, by the way. Um, you know, I'm trying to mix it up a little bit, but... Uh, this time's question was phrased as follows. Romans 7, verses 13 through 25, can be confusing. Please elaborate. Technically, that's not a question. So, uh, yes, there. Uh, I agree. Romans 7 is confusing. Moving on. Uh, well, it's really more of a request. We'll look at Romans 7. Um, in some ways, might, this might eat up all our time tonight. I don't really know. I haven't timed this out. Okay, basically, it works like this. Now, let's get our heads around the context, first of all. Uh, the book of Romans is, first and foremost, about the gospel. And the message of the gospel being the fact that we are justified by having trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior. And that really, that's expanded and discussed a lot in the first four chapters. And chapters 5 through 8 really deal more with kind of the end result of that. The hope of the gospel, we might say. And so that's why chapter 5, Paul talks about how since we have been justified by faith, oh, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exult in hope of the glory of God. And what follows is a discourse on hope that extends all the way really into chapter 8. And chapter 8, um, Paul concludes with this grand speech about how there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? I'm convinced in verses 38 and 39, he says that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a... A uh, pretty high note to end on, although he doesn't end the letter there. He keeps going to talk about some other subjects in chapters 9 and following. But chapter eight and chapters 5 through 8 clearly deal with the hope of the gospel. But there is a sort of a fly in the ointment, if you will, and that's the, sec the chapters that go right between that, chapters 6 and 7, which talk a lot about death and sin and all of the horrible things that happen. Uh, that's why Paul, in Romans 6, he says, you know, shall we continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? And he goes on to exhort the Romans how they should not let their mortal bodies be enslaved to sin. Do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you obey his lusts, he says in verse 12 of chapter 6. Uh, in verse 23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And throughout chapters 5, 6, 7, and 8, there's this back and forth pull of contrast between life and death, between righteousness and sin, between justification and condemnation. And we get to chapter 7, and I realize this is coming really fast, there's a lot of information, and it, I'm sorry, it's Romans, and Romans is a really dense, difficult book, so... Uh, we are going to go through this kind of a, a little bit of a breakneck pace. I apologize for that. We do have DVDs available if you want to rewind and, uh, I guess, get the part that I spoke too fast about. Uh, but it, or, if you have a question and you want me to clarify something, you can simply raise your hand and ask to. So we'll keep that in mind. In chapter 7, what we have is really kind of three parts. The first six verses are about how the believer dies to the law. And then verses 7 through 13 are about how the law itself brought about sin and death. And verses 14 through 25 is a description of the conflict brought about through the law. So, let's go. Um, okay, so here we go. We're supposed to die to the law. And uh, verses 7 through 13, the law brings death. And in verses... Seven, uh, chapter 7, verses 14 through 25, we have the conflict 
created by the law. All right. That's the basic outline of the chapter. Now, the question primarily concerned, uh, the question actually said verses 13 through 25, which you'll notice I broke the verses uh, off a little bit on the way that we've divided this up. But the primary focus, the part that people find confusing, and rightly so, is verses 14 through 25, because Paul engages in what can only be described as a tongue twister, and... Which, I, I mean, I, you, you just got to wonder. It's, it, Dennis and I were talking this morning about it. He says, you know, I think that when they read that in the congregation at Rome, they probably read that and go, okay, back up and read that again. What, what did Paul just say? Because <laughs> I, I, Romans 7, he, he, cut, he, he goes through it at a rather breakneck pace here. Uh, now, for the chapter 7, I'll pick up in verse 1. Do you not know, brethren, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has jurisdiction over a person as long as he lives? For the married woman is bound by law to her husband while he is living, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law concerning her husband. So then, if, while her husband is living, she is joined to another man, she shall be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from the law, so that she is not an adulteress, even though she is joined to another man. Therefore, my brethren, you also were made to die to the law through the body of Christ, so that you might be joined to another, to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For while we were in the flesh, the sinful passage which were aroused by the law were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that by which we were bound, so that we serve in newness of the Spirit and not in oldness of the letter." Now, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip the part about marriage and just say that it's an analogy for, well, just as marriage ends with death, our relationship with the law ends with death. We die to the law. What Paul's really getting at here, though, is that there are two ways of living, two modes of living. Uh, we are either in the flesh or we are in the spirit. We are supposed to serve in the newness of the, le of the spirit rather than the oldness of the letter, it says in verse 6. And this is not the first time Paul has made this contrast in his writings. If you read the book of Galatians, Paul talks about the deeds of the flesh and the fruits of the Spirit. The deeds of the flesh include things like fornication and immorality and sensuality and uh, disputes, dissensions, factions, all sorts of evil things and things like that. He's not giving an all-inclusive list, whereas the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, and onwards from that. Uh, you know, so the spirit produces good things, the flesh produces bad things. And you're going to live in one of those two ways. How can you tell if someone is in the flesh or in the spirit? Look at what they produce. Look at their fruits. Look at the kind of person they are. And that, that's pretty straightforward. Uh, now, Paul here, though, he, in verse 6, he phrases it in an interesting way. He says, we are to, put to serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. He uses letter instead of flesh there. But what's the point of that? Well, we've actually seen that contrast before back in Romans chapter 2. In Romans chapter 2, in verses 28 and 29, Paul says that he is not a Jew who was one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. You see how that works there. You have outward, you have inward. You have of the flesh, you have of the heart. You have of the letter, you have of the Spirit. Those are contrasts, back and forth. Something is either from men, or it is from God. Jesus asked that question to the Pharisees. Where did John's baptism come from? Did it come from heaven? Did it come from men? There's only two places something can come from. There's only two places an action can come from. There's only two ways you can live when it really all boils down to it. You can either live for God or you can live for self and for your own selfish ideas of doing things. Now, why letter? Why is letter opposed to spirit? Why is letter on the bad side of that? I mean... You think of the letter, and we're talking about what is written here. You think, well, the scriptures are uh, certainly a good thing, aren't they? I mean, and that in part is why we have Romans 7 and the difficult dilemma that Paul wrestles with here. Uh, because it, what it said, what this suggests is that something is more important than mere conformity to the physical standard. 
The law must actually be written on our hearts. Jeremiah 31 says, They will not teach each one his neighbor and each one his brother, saying, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. God says, I will write my law on their hearts. Now, just because you've physically done everything you're supposed to do, just because, you know, you bear the marks of the covenant, the, you know, well, we were circumcised on the eighth day, and we keep the Sabbath, and we keep all the food laws, and we do all of the different little rituals that we're supposed to do, that somehow makes us right with God. No, it doesn't. Paul says the law must be written on your heart. Ooh. Okay, don't point at my heart anymore. I've got that. Um, the law must be written on the heart. I have this exercise I do with my children. I ask them, where's your heart? And they're point, supposed to point to that area. And there the microphone is. So I get myself into all sorts of trouble. Um, okay. So now what happens here is you have these two kinds of people then. People who care about what men think, who are oriented towards the flesh, and people who care about what God thinks, who are oriented towards the spirit. And if we live in the flesh, what happens? Well, keep reading... Uh, you know, the law arouses our sinful passions, God's commandment. God's commandments telling us not to do all that stuff makes us actually want to do those things. And our sinful passions work in our body to bear fruit for death. Our desire to do bad things gets trapped inside of us, fight so hard to get out, we eventually do bad things, and when that happens, sin wins, and we're dead. That's not a very happy picture at all. And somebody could hear that argument and say, well, yeah, okay, if God telling you not to do stuff makes you want to do it more and eventually causes you to sin, then wouldn't you, doesn't that mean that sin is God's fault somehow? Well, you and I know the answer to that. Oh, if, God, but, but if God hadn't given us all these commandments, he wouldn't have fanned the flame of our sinful passions. Well, look at verse 7. Paul brings this up. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? May it never be. That's the wrong answer, Paul says. On the contrary, I would not have come to know sin except for the law, through the law. For I would not have known about coveting if the law had said, You shall not covet. But sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, produced in me coveting of every kind. For apart from the law, sin is dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it killed me. So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. Therefore, did what was good become a cause of death for me? May it ever be! Rather, it was sin, in order that it might be shown to be sin, by affecting my death through that which is good, so that through the commandment, sin would become utterly sinful." And as a side note, I just got to love how the, the uncommon use of effect as a verb there. You know, sin causing death is the idea. Now, is, is, the law, you know, is the law to blame for the mess humanity is in? I mean, after all, we're seeing in verses 7 through 13 how the law brings about death. And since God's the one that made the law, is God to blame since he's the one that made the rules? How do we explain what it says in verse 5 where it says that sinful passions were aroused by the law and were at work in the members of our body to bear fruit for death? Well, Paul says, you know, it's not the law's fault. The law is not sin. The law had a purpose. And what was that purpose that the law had? He says it right here. Purpose of the law is to point out the problem of sin. And Paul's kind of already said that earlier in Romans, in Romans chapter 3 and verse 20. By the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. How do you know what bad things are? How do you know what's right and wrong? Well, there's a bunch of rules that tell you what not to do. And that's how you, that's how you first learn what's right and wrong. That's how you learn the things that God likes and doesn't like. He gives you the law. He tells you, don't do this thing, do this thing. And so, if it hadn't been for the law, if it hadn't been for the commandments, would we know what sin was? Would we have any idea? Would we know, well, God doesn't want you to do that. Really? Well, where did he say that? Because we don't have any commandments on the subject. We wouldn't know what things are sin, what things are not sin. We would be lost without a compass. So the law has a purpose. It has to tell you what sin is. It helps our understanding of good and evil become more accurate. And... Paul uses coveting as a case study of this in verses 7 and 8. 
Coveting is... Um, because, I mean, would you know that coveting was wrong if the law had said, don't covet? If the law hadn't said that? Uh, Exodus 20, verse 17, Deuteronomy 5, 21. Well, Paul says, I wouldn't have known that was wrong. But there was a bad side effect to learning that coveting was wrong, in that now that Paul knows that it's wrong, suddenly he kind of wants to covet more than anything. It produces in me coveting of every kind. Sin took opportunity through that commandment and caused Paul to start coveting everything. It's like when your mother tells you, you know, oh, I don't want you to touch that vase. Well, I wasn't thinking about that vase before you said anything. But now that you've said something, now I really want to touch that vase. And now I'm now ten times more likely to break it when you're out of the room. Well, you weren't thinking about it before she said anything, but now she says something. Now that's the one thing you want to do more than anything else in the world is touch that vase. Coveting... Coveting is kind of a, a, a funny thing, you know, because, I mean, a lot of people can go through life. It's not that hard to go through life without killing somebody or without committing adultery, you know. And, I mean, if you're really conscientious, you can avoid things like stealing and lying as well. But coveting, oh man, coveting is something that eats you up on the inside, isn't it? You know, I don't think any of us can get away from coveting, totally. And coveting, in a sense, is what, what went wrong at the beginning. God said, don't. Don't eat of the fruit of that tree. And what did Eve do? Well, she saw it. She saw that it was so good, and she got really excited about it. She coveted that fruit. And coveting gave birth to more and more sins, and eventually led to death. All right. But make no mistake, Paul says, just because that happened doesn't make the law the culprit. The culprit is... What's the real culprit here? The real culprit is sin. And he personifies sin here as something that takes opportunity. Sin is something that deceives. Sin is something that kills. It's almost like you could take sin out and replace it with Satan. Because that's what's really going on here. Uh, he personifies sin as this evil thing that causes all these different problems. And so here we see the law's intention. In verse 9, I was once alive apart from the law. But when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. This commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death for me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. Sin, the law was supposed to result in life. It had a good intention. Leviticus 18.5 says, if you keep these commandments, if you do these commandments, you will live. And the law is holy and righteous and good. In verse 12, he says, but the problem is that sin is using the law for its own purposes. What did Satan do to Eve in the garden? How did he deceive her? First thing he does is he starts talking about God's commands. Has God told you not to eat any fruit of the training tree in the garden? Well, that wasn't God's command, was it? Not at all. You know, but he tries to pass God off as the super strict, malevolent deity that wants to control them. And... You know, he cast it as if God were being somehow unfair through this commandment of his. So, I mean, first you straw man the commandment and make it, you know, make them question the straw man. And then Eve goes, well, that wasn't really what God said. What God said was this. And Satan said, well, that's still kind of unreasonable, isn't it? I mean, you know, God knows that if you eat that fruit, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. I mean, he made this rule up for his own advantage rather than for your good. And so suddenly, Satan is putting all of this attention on the commandment, all of this attention on the law. He is using the law to make them want to sin. That's what Satan did. And that's the story of human history right there. Sin, verse 11, sin, taking opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. That's what Satan did to Eve in the Garden of Eden, and that's what sin does to us every time we sin. Satan's use of the command produces coveting of every kind in Eve, and the rest is history. Okay, well, if God knew this was going to happen, why did he make so many laws? I mean, you know, it's like Ezekiel 20. He talks about how he, made, he gave them rules by which they could not live. Why did God do this? Well, I mean, you know, what was a cause supposed to be good? Did it become a cause of death? Paul says in verse 13, no. Rather, it was sin in order that it might be shown to be sin by affecting my death through that which is good so that through the commandment sin would become utterly sinful. Now, does sin need help becoming sinful? Well, no. Sin's already sinful. That's what it is, by definition. But when Paul says it would become sinful, what he's talking about is how it would be shown to be sinful. 
And this is how the law's function is realized. By pointing out the problem of sin. Sin is... Uh, the law, the sin's use of the law demonstrates how bad sin really is. How it can take something that's so good and pure and twist it and contort it into a cause of death. Okay. Alright, so that brings us... That's the problem. That's where we're at. And, you know, the problem is not the rules themselves. The rules are good. The problem is that the rules do nothing to change the heart of the sinner. The law is constantly saying, you know, this... Stealing is bad. Don't steal. Killing people is bad. Don't kill. It tells you how to get into a mess. It tells you to stay out of the mess. It doesn't do a lot to get you out of the mess. And it doesn't really do a lot to prevent you from wanting to get into the mess in the first place. We know that the law is spiritual. Paul's a flesh. He's sold in bondage to sin. The law is telling people, the law even told people to do this. You need to make sure your heart is right. You need to love the Lord with all your heart. You need to circumcise your heart to the Lord. Deuteronomy 10.16, Deuteronomy 6.5. Was the law concerned about the heart? Yeah, it was. But did the law do anything to actually change the heart? No. Do we keep the commandments because we want to? Or because God forces us to? That's God's goal since the beginning, is to get people to circumcise their hearts. All right. That's, that's down to verse 13. Okay. We haven't even gotten into the part where the question was yet. That's just all the background info. So I'm going to stop here for a second and ask any questions before we move on. All right. Now we get into verse 14. And this is where we take the plunge. We know, for we know that the law is spiritual. But I am of flesh sold into bondage to sin. For what I am doing, I do not understand. I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. But, if I do the very thing I do not want to do, I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good. So now, long, no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh. For the willing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. For the good that I want, I do not do. But I practice the very evil that I do not want. But if I am doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Okay. Uh, I'll keep reading. I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man. But I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my members. Wretched man that I am! Who will set me free from the body of this death? Thanks be to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then on the one hand, I myself with my mind am serving the law of God, but on the other with my flesh, the law of sin. Okay, now my Bible heading has, wrote at the top of this, the conflict of two natures, which I don't think is a very helpful heading. Um, you, you can judge for yourself. Is Paul talking out of both sides of his mouth here? It's kind of this vicious cycle, you will. I mean, he says, I don't understand what I'm doing. I'm doing something I hate. I, if I do what I don't want, I agree with the law. Well, if that happens, I'm not really the one doing it. Sin's doing it, dwelling in me. And then nothing, but, so nothing good is dwelling in me. I want to do good, but I don't want to do good. Well, he says both of those things in verse 18. Uh, I don't do the good things that I want to do. I do the bad things that I don't want to do, verse 19. Since I'm doing something I don't want to do, well, it's not really me doing it. It's still sin, verse 20. This proves that sin is dwelling in me even though I really want to do good things, verse 21. On the inside, I totally agree with the law, verse 22. On the outside, I'm obviously not keeping it, verse 23. Uh, there's... There's a couple of things we'll note. First of all, uh, what we have is kind of an A, B, C, A, B, C pattern. And uh, what we'll have here, I guess, is just kind of to line these up. Uh, the A sections are basically characterized by this expression, I know. That's the A's. 
And uh, Paul, in, in verse 14, he says, we, well, not I know, but we know. Verse 14 is, we know that the law is spiritual. And verse 18 is, I know that nothing good dwells in me. All right? Uh, now, the next thing is uh, the B sections, which is doing stuff you don't want to do. Doing stuff you don't want. And that's characterized in uh, verse 15, which says, I know What I'm doing, I do not understand. I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I'm doing the very thing I hate. And in verse 19, the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. You see how verses 15 and 19 say basically the same thing. And the third element in verses 16, 17, and 20, we'll call that the C sections. And that is more about, it's not me, but it's sin. In other words, I'm not really the one doing this thing, but sin which dwells in me is doing that. Verses 16 and 17, I do the very thing I do not want to do. I agree with the law, confessing that the law is good, so no longer am I the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. Verse 20, if I'm doing the very thing I do not want, I am no longer the one doing it, but sin which dwells in me. You see how Paul uses equivalent phrases again in verses 16 and 17 and in verse 20. Uh, you know, so he... Basically, what he does here in verses 14 through 20 is he says the same thing twice. And that, that I, it's on purpose. Because it's designed to show you how we're going in a circle. And how we're not coming to a reasonable conclusion on this. This is the problem with law and sin. This is the, op, uh, of course, this idea that sin dwells in me is answered in chapter 8 by the spirit dwelling in the Christian. That's what we got, again, that antithesis going on. Sin is not casually residing, it is completely dominating. The mind set on fleshly things inevitably becomes mastered by sin. The law prohibits sin, but its preoccupation with fleshly requirement caused the mind to focus on fleshly things. This is where, this is where I think, you know, there's a, there's a huge distinction. There are two different ways to approach the scripture, or to preach it, if we will. You know, there's, of course, the one mindset that wants to perceive the Bible solely as a list of do's and don'ts. Now, the Bible has do's and don'ts in it. The Bible has thou shalt and thou shalt not. It has things you're not supposed to do and things you're supposed to do. But, if that's all it is to you, then this is the cycle you will be stuck in. I guarantee it. Because there's a lot more to the story. Well, I mean, for starters, the story itself... I mean, narrative by its very nature is not a list of do's and don'ts. It's a description of how God does things. And uh, it's the story of how God has acted throughout human history. The laws are there, certainly. But the first and primary result of the Bible is this relationship that God desires to have with His people. As a father to His children. As a husband to His bride. Now, okay, so that, that's, that's part of the problem. Another key question here, and this one sometimes comes up, is when Paul is talking in verses 14 through 25, is he talking about his previous life under the law of Moses? Or is he talking about his current struggle as a Christian? That frequently gets asked too. Uh, now, um, the one, there's really only one argument that can be made that I am aware of uh, that would characterize this as a present moral struggle, and that's the fact that Paul's actually writing it. All of Paul's verbs are in the present tense. Uh, he, but the problem with that, of course, is it ignores the fact that you know, tenses in Greek are already very flexible things in the first place. And second of all, Paul can speak in the present tense simply for vividness. You know, I can tell you a story, and I can tell you about that time, how I go to the store, and how I pay for something, and I'm telling the whole story in present tense. We have that way of talking in English as well to be more vivid, and that same thing exists in their language. But more likely, the context immediately supports the idea of Paul describing his life under the law. This is what the law did to me before Christ came. Now, Paul gives a solution to the problem. And the solution to the problem is obviously, in verse 25, Jesus. Jesus Christ, our Lord. The present tense is a way to make the point more vivid. 
Now, here's where it gets tricky, though. Now, contextually, he's clearly talking about the law of Moses. But man, oh man, does the struggle in verses 14 through 20 sound familiar to any of us on a daily basis? Yeah, uh-huh. Okay, all right, so let's back up for a second then. Is it possible that it's both and, rather than either or? Contextually, yes, this is the problem with the law of Moses, but boy, oh boy, I think a lot of Christians are still kind of hung up on law, aren't they? Perhaps the real reason the struggle sounds familiar is that we have not truly freed ourselves from the law the way the Bible says we're supposed to. Why can't I stop sinning, people ask. Is there a reason the struggle sounds so familiar? Well, you know, the problem is answered by the coming of Christ, yes. Well, the problem will be answered again by the coming of Christ. So there's that as well. That needs to be the lesson that we get out of this. In verses 22 and onward, Paul... Well, in verse 21, Paul says, I find then the law that evil is present in me. Um, my Bible, in the New American Standard, translates the word law in verse 21 as principle, which uh, I kind of wish they hadn't done that because it's the same word that's translated law everywhere else in this passage. Uh, and it's, Paul uses the word law all over this text and sometimes in several different ways. Now, it may mean principle. I find... Here's one law, like kind of, you know, we talk about the law of gravity, but here's the law of sin dwelling in me. You can't really budge it. It's the principle. Sin dwells in people. And that's, it's like a law of nature. But on the other hand, you have the law of God. So you got the law that sin dwells in him. You got the law of God in the inner man in verse 22 that he joyfully concurs with. That's two different laws you have living inside you. Now, I mean, it's hard enough to juggle legal codes in the secular world. What happens when you have two legal, legal ideas, two ideas of what is law dwelling within your very person? Well, and what happens, verse 23, I see a different law in the members of my body waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin which is in my member. So, again, to give you the contrast... Well, there's the law that evil is in me versus the desire to do good. There's the different law versus the law of God. There's the law of sin versus the law of the mind. There's the body versus the inner man. There's the law of sin and death versus the law of the spirit of life, which he talks about in chapter 8. Is the law the answer to sin? It's certainly uh, exacerbating the problem of sin. But yes, Paul says law actually is the answer to sin. In verse 2, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. Not just any law, but the law of the Spirit. Or some places call it the law of Christ. And when we talk about that, we're not talking about... But we need to understand something. When the Bible talks about the law of Christ, it isn't like God had this huge list of do's and don'ts that was the law of Moses and then said, okay, crumple up, throw it in the wastebasket... I've made a, another list of do's and don'ts. Follow that one instead. Goodbye. Have a good day. Uh, I mean, show me the list. <laughs> well, the list isn't there, except perhaps in some extrapolated principle. And Paul himself frequently quotes the law of Moses after the fact, including in Romans 13. Well, what's going on here? Again, you know, the reason the law of Christ is in some sense, you know, conformity to Christ himself. What Christ taught, how Christ lived, how he behaved. Christ takes the law and fulfills it. He is the goal of the law, the end of the law, for righteousness for all who believe. Romans 10 and verse 4. The law of Christ is effectively conformity to Christ himself. And if we are not conformed to Christ, we are not conformed to he who was the personification of God's law, well then, you know, good luck figuring it out. And that's, the dif that's I think, the difference between simply having a, you know, a list of, you know, a list of commandments, which... You can have, there's nothing wrong with the list of commandments, we've got that. But the problem with the list of commandments is that it's not enough to transform the heart. You need Christ in the picture. The final element, the completion of this whole thing. Somebody who actually comes along and lives it. Persona, I mean, you know, that's the real law. It's defined in this person of Jesus Christ. Now, now, some people have taken that idea too far, and they've said, well, you know, 
As long as I respect the person of Jesus Christ, I don't have to actually do anything. He says, i got news for you. If you don't do what Jesus says, you don't respect the person of Jesus Christ. And I mean, I had that conversation with anybody. Mom, Dad, you know, I've decided I, I respect you in the office of parent and generic authority, but, you know, I, I just, even though I, even though I really, really respect you, I'm going to show my respect for you by not doing what you say. That makes sense to anybody else here? Doesn't make sense to me. No, that's not how it works. You still have to actually do what God says. And that's, I mean, Paul never argues for anything otherwise. But what he is arguing for is a, a different way of thinking about the problem. Because the problem is, you know, if, if we're sitting around and, oh no, what happened? Uh, well, I, I sinned and I violated this particular commandment over here. Well, it should be, I sinned, I didn't live up to my calling, which is in Christ Jesus, which I was told to walk worthy of. You know, you look at Ephesians chapter 4, it says, walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you have been called. We need to understand that God takes sin personally. You hear people define sin as a transgression of law. That's true. That is a true definition of sin. But it's not the only definition the Bible gives. And in the end result, you know, you might as well say, well, you know, the definition of an airplane is something that has wheels. Well, yeah, it also has wings and uh, propellers and other things that make it fly. And sin. Does God take sin personally? You better believe He does. When David is writing in Psalm 51, he doesn't say, oh no, I broke the adultery commandment. He says, against you, you only, I have sinned. You know, and that's what it is. When Joseph is confronted by Potiphar's wife, he doesn't cite legal code. He says, how can I do this great evil and sin against God? God takes sin personally. And he uses law as an answer to sin in personifying it in Jesus Christ. Alright, so that's whew, that's it in a nutshell, um, I guess. I have, I'm not going to get into the other question. You're disappointed. Just a spoiler alert, the next question dealt with dancing. I'll let you uh, decide where we're going with that. But uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pick up with that next time. Alright, because we're 10 till now. Anybody got any, anybody feel like it's still muddy? Hmm? Okay. First step is admitting you have a problem, right? 